All right, hello, good morning. So today we start our final unit. Um, we're going to be moving towards the fundamental theorem of calculus, which is really about um, adding up those infinitely small slices we came up with with differentiation. We're moving towards an operation called integration. And we're going to motivate this unit with a simple question, which is how do we measure the distance traveled? Or how do we measure area under a curve? And how are they connected? In the same way before, if you recall, that we had the tangent problem, which is like if I have a curved surface, how do I find a line that is tangent to it at a single point? Or if I had a you know position curve, S of T, how do I measure the velocity at a given point? Right, that uh, that um, rate of change, delta Y over delta T, or delta S over delta T at an instantaneous rate. So that was the initial problem of calculus. Now we're moving towards measuring the total distance traveled. So we'll start with a very easy question and let that motivate the rest of the topic. So how far did I travel if I was going 45 miles per hour for two hours? Don't overthink this. 45 miles per hour for two hours. This is a product of these two. You can even see that the units here, hours, will cancel and you'll be left with 90 miles. Okay. So you might even remember this formula from some um, physics class or something like this that the velocity times the change in time gives you the total distance traveled. Um, so just to, so this will, this will kind of highlight the whole day, the whole lecture here. So we can just kind of highlight this. Um, and uh, say again, if we were going 80 miles an hour for half an hour, this would be 80 times 0.5, you'll be left with 40 miles. So there's two things happening, right? We've got the, the velocity, which is constant in these two cases. And you've got this change in time, this window of time, which is given here. Okay, so it's not just t like the moment in time, but it is a window in time. So another way you could think about it is maybe v times some like b minus a equals d, something like this. From t equals a to t equals b. All right. Now, why is this the easy question? Well, it was pretty easy, first of all. And second of all, the velocity was constant, right? Like we were on cruise control. But what if the velocity was a function of time? Um, this is obviously the more interesting question because most things are changing. They're not constant. So how do we deal with this? So first of all, let's look at the example we were just on. So if this is the velocity graph, okay, velocity on the vertical, time on the horizontal. The last graph I was looking at um, or the last function I was looking at, rather, 45 miles an hour for two hours. What does that look like graphically? Well, since it's constant, we know a constant graph is just a flat line going on indefinitely. We'll call this our V of T equals 45. So this is our simple function. And we know we are going for two hours, right? So we could assume that we started at time equals 0, 1, 2. And so this is like our stopping point. And what's very interesting is that we took a product to get the total distance traveled. And if you look at this as a simple box, and you see that this area in between is really a length of 2 and a height of 45, we get that 45 times 2 equals 90. There's that area for the 90 miles traveled. This idea generalizes. And I can have you do it on your own, but I'm going and you will. Um, but I'm going to just kind of walk through a few examples here uh, to quickly get across the idea. So maybe I'll put this back over here. 45 times two equals 90. This is kind of you know um, what length times width equals the area, and this is also you know velocity times delta t equals d. All this is really the same idea. But again, this was the easy problem. What about when velocity is not constant? Well, if we have something like this, let's say that the 
velocity function does something like this. Okay, it starts at one, and maybe it comes up here to a height of three over a length of uh, four. Okay, so here's my velocity curve, velocity axis, t-axis. And so, you know, this is kind of like maybe my, my velocity is increasing steadily over this time. Okay, so if I'm riding a bike and it's, you know, slowly increasing, like an exercise bike, something like this, my velocity increased from one to three. Um, you know, we could say miles per hour or feet per second or, or whatever you want. We're going to generalize it for right now. And on t-axis, we've got seconds, let's say. So let's say feet per second up here. So how far did I go? Well, now it's not just I went, you know, one foot per second for four seconds. Um, it is, it's more complicated. But the idea is still the same, that we're after the uh, area under the curve, right? If I can find that product, the amount of, um, you know, the rate times the change in time, then I will have the total distance traveled. So if we were to just find the area under this curve using geometry, we'd be dead on. So here we could, you could do a trapezoid or you could just split this up to be like, well, here's a, here's a rectangle. We'll call this area one. We'll call this triangle area two. Area one is going to be four times one, right? Well, let's use the velocity first, just the one times the change in time, which is four, which is four feet. And area two is the change in the um, velocity. So from one to three is two, right? And then we've got um, the length of time again, four. But this is over two since it's a triangle. And so this is another four feet. And so A1 plus A2 equals the total distance since it's the total area. And that is eight feet. Okay, so that's if velocity is not constant. We're still looking for area under the curve. But if it's a uh, function where we can use geometry, this is great. We can find what that is. But most functions also don't look as simple as a line, right? So what are we kind of left to do? Let's say the general case. I've got some curved function, v of t got some uh, v axis over here, t axis over here. Let's just say, in case it comes up, this is feet per second, and this is seconds here. How do I find the distance traveled? Let's say I start at some point A, I end at some point B. The distance traveled equals the area under v of t. So first of all, let's put that in a box. And so we're really looking for, you know, this area under here. But how do we measure that? How do we measure that? We can't do it with geometry because, right, the, the way I just did it before using squares and triangles doesn't really cut it when it comes to curved um, lines, or rather just curves. So, right, there's no, there's no geometric formula that can get me the area under this thing. So what do we do? We use limits. Since this function is curved, we can approach um, infinitely small shadings of this, of this um, area. And so how we'll do it, let me back this out here. We won't use limits yet. We'll just point to the idea. We can easily measure the area under here or approximate it by using a bunch of different rectangles, right? Maybe from here to here, find some good rectangles to approximate Right, we'll call this R1, R2, R3, up to Rn. And if we take the areas of all of these, we 
This is going to be approximately the distance traveled. Right? So this is a very rough algorithm. This might be something that, you know, like a, a middle schooler could come up with at like a problem solving championship. You know, how do you find the area under curve? This is a good technique. It's pretty rough because you're using rectangles on something that's curved. But you might see the more rectangles we use or the more that we shrink this delta t length for each of these, the more accurate we'll get, right? So this is the uh, basic idea. And there's ways to generate under and over estimates. And we'll go through that actually in a, an example in a bit. But here is just another visual on you know, this process, again, the since velocity can be signed, we can actually drop below the x-axis. All of my examples have not been that so far. But the idea is the same, that you'd actually be maybe accumulating some distance in the negative direction, right? So, um, you know, let's say over here, we're moving in the positive direction because my velocity is positive. Then we're moving in the negative direction because my velocity is negative, And then moving back again in the positive direction. So this is kind of like we turned around and then turned around again. And so what we're after is this exact area, and this will tell us the exact distance traveled. That's the, that's the basic idea. Okay, so formally with uh, a bit more notation here, how can we approximate that exact area with rectangles? Well, we say it's the limit of the R sub Ns. So if I just kind of, you know, draw this out here, Here's my um, rectangles here, where at each of these points, here's x1, x2, x3, x4. Here's f of x1. Here's the height. Here's f of x2, the height. f of x3, f of x4. This is the y value. So this is really giving you the height of the rectangle. And then the distance between these x's, this is your delta x. So here you can see length times width plus length times width plus dot 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 plus length times width. So if we grab all of these length times widths, oops, and we let the number of those rectangles go to infinity, then we go from these crude rectangles all the way to, you know, if our curve is doing something like this. It's almost like you're shading it in by hand, right? They're pencil thin or even thinner because they're infinitesimally small. And we're going to get the best approximation for that area. Okay. And, and it, as we take the limit, we will get the exact area as long as the function f is what we call integrable, which is, you know, smooth and continuous, just like we like for differentiation of functions. But okay, to illustrate how this works as a concept, uh, pre-limits, we'll just be doing this kind of by hand since we don't have a, a graph or a, a formula for a function. Let's say we, the numerical perspective, we have a table and Ted runs a marathon. His friend Bill rides behind him and clocks his speed every 15 minutes. So he starts strong, but has to stop eventually. So we have his speed, his rate, right? Again, this is kind of like your DSDT or DXDT. And uh, you have the, the time. So give upper and lower estimates for how far Ted ran during the first 30 minutes and 90 minutes. So how far Ted ran is the distance, right? That's the total distance. And we know that this is really the area under the velocity curve. So... How do we find the area under the velocity curve when all we have are these uh, this table of values? Well, we do it by making under and over estimates using this rectangle method. Okay, so I'll draw it graphically, but you don't need to necessarily do this. Um, so for the first 30 minutes, we've got data at 0, 15, and 30 minutes. And here's his velocity um, graph here. So he starts at a speed of 12 at time equals zero. We've clocked him at 12 here. At 15 minutes, he's been clocked at 11. Right? Oops. And at 30 minutes, he's been clocked at 10. So here's 10. 
All right. So what do we know? Well, we don't know what happens in between each of these things, but we can do our best. And so what our best could be would be to overestimate and to underestimate how far he went during this time. So the best thing we could say was that, you know, maybe for the first 15 minutes, he was running at 12 miles an hour, um, you know, at full clip until that last moment when he stopped. Now, he probably slowed down or did something like this, right? But that's, that's we can't really be too accurate with that. The best we can do is say, maybe he went just like a constant, we'll assume the highest possible, right? Just like if you're um, trying to predict how much something's going to cost, you want to highball it, right? You assume the highest cost possible. So we'll overestimate that maybe he ran 12 for the first um, for the first 15 minutes, and then he went 11 miles an hour for the next 15 minutes. We're assuming since he's slowing down too, by the way, um, that. He's not going to be increasing back up in the middle of these windows. He's slowing down because he's getting tired. He's running a marathon. And then at the at the last second here, at the 30-minute mark, we had him at 10. And so maybe, you know, for that next window, we could say he was running at most 10 miles an hour. There's also the uh, worst-case scenario that, you know, at the um, zero-minute mark, even though we had him at... 12 that we could assume that he was running at you know maybe he started at 12 and then was um for that interval going really just 11 miles an hour right the kind of the underestimate would be 11 since we know that he eventually got down to there so to be on the soft side we could say he was going at least 11 miles per hour here and for that second window he was going at least 10 miles an hour for this window we know he started at 11 but he got down to 10 right so for an underestimate, we would use 11 for the first window and uh, 10 for the second window here. Again, we're really just focused on this first 30-minute window. So our uh, overestimate, or let's start with where we're at. Our underestimate would be to take that 11 times the delta T plus 10 times the delta T. What's our delta T here? Our delta T is 15. So we could say he went at least 11 times 15 minutes plus 10 times 15 minutes. Um, and actually, I'm going to make a correction here. Our delta T is not 15 uh, minutes. It's really a quarter hour if we want to stick with the rate. All right, so these are 15 minutes. But since our rate is in miles per hour, you can really think of this as like zero hours, a quarter hour, half an hour, three quarters hour, oop, one hour, etc. All right, just to keep our units consistent, because this is in hours, right? This rate, and then this is in minutes. So, and if that would help you to change this up too, that's totally fine. All right, so let's backtrack here. Sorry about that. So 11 times 0.25 plus uh, 10 times 0.25 will give us another way you could do this, since I'm doing this kind of by hand for the moment, is 0.25 times um, 21, right? So 21 over 4, which is really, uh, what, 5.25? So what does this mean? 5.25 um, Sorry, it was accosted by a doggy there. Um, so 5.25 is what we get. This is the total distance traveled as an underestimate for this half hour. So this would be in miles. All right, this guy's clipping, right? He's a marathon runner. Um, and so that's our underestimate. Our overestimate, however, we're going to take the other side of things, we'll say overestimate would be if we assumed he ran 12 miles for that first quarter hour, and then we assume that he ran 11, uh, 11 miles per hour for that second quarter hour. Did I say miles here? This is miles per hour. 
And so this would be, you know, 23 times 0.25, which is going to be what five and three quarters, 5.75 miles. Okay, so this is our overestimate that he ran maybe at most five and three quarters miles. He ran at least five and a quarter miles. So what we'd call our best estimate would be what? Well, an average of the two, 5.25 plus 5.75 over two, which will give us 5.5 miles. All right, so that's the kind of the best you can do in this given situation. But in general, what we had was a rate at time t and the given delta t. And we can use this process of overestimating and underestimating to generate um, our best guess. Um, so now it's, it's asking us to do it for the first 90 minutes. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to give myself another page here. So we're really just going to kind of open up this process. Our overestimate now is going to be to take the higher of the two from each uh, snapshot. So, right, if what I kind of do is I look at these as little windows of time here, 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 and here. And if I'm going with an overestimate on this time window, then I go for the higher number of the two for each delta t. So this first delta t, that 0.25 hours times, well, we said 12 minutes was the overestimate here. Um, you know, you can call this you know, R1, R2, R3, R4, if we want to do that. You don't need to do this. This is just for kind of our illustrating purposes, plus R2. The higher of the two here is going to be 0.25 times 11 instead of 10. For R3, all we have is 10 for both of those, so we can assume 10. For R4, um, the higher of the two would be 10, so we'll keep that. So 0.25 times 10 again, plus R5, should have pluses up here putting them down below and not above. Okay, today's not my day with interruptions. So it looks like we were on R5. So for this uh, interval here, we're gonna take eight as the higher of the two with our overestimate, right? And then for R6, again, we would take the seven instead of the zero, right? We assume that he was going at most seven, even though we know he was going at least zero, um, if that makes sense. So then for here, again, one way to do this is to factor out the delta t. This 0.25, you got this delta t times the sum of all the uh, values inside. And so that's 12 plus 11 plus 10 plus 10 plus 8 plus 7. And, you know, in here you could say this is like, you know, v1 plus v2 plus v3, et cetera up to plus Vn, those velocities. And so this should give you the distance traveled. All right, so let's fire this off. So we've got 0 0.25. That's a little better. 0 0.25 times 12 plus 11 plus 10 plus 10, plus 8, plus 7, 14.5. All right, 14.5 what? This is the distance traveled, so we're saying miles, okay? Um, so 14.5 miles as the overestimate. So how about the underestimate? Take a moment, think about it yourself, how you would change things to do the uh, underestimate. Is that what I said? The underestimate. How would you change things to do the um, underestimate? This is not letting me swap this out. Here we go.
our underestimate for each of these would be to take the lower of the two, and that's really just the difference. So here I'll fast forward to kind of that second part where it's you can pull out that delta t and just take then the lower of the two each time. So I'll take 11 and then 10, and then 10 again, and then 8, and then 7, and then 0. Um, obviously adding 0 is silly, but I'm doing it as a placeholder to show you that we've kept all the rectangles, all the heights of those rectangles. We get 11.5. So that's our underestimate. Okay, so our overestimate is uh, 14.5 miles. Our underestimate is 11.5 miles. So our best estimate would be 14.5 plus 11.5 all over 2, which would give us what halfway between those two would be 13 miles. Okay, so this is how we would uh, estimate based on a table. Okay, and this is how we do it graphically as well. And it's the same real process for even when we have a function, but we take the limit when we have the formula for the function. Okay, so we can be much, much more precise. Um, this last question is kind of interesting. It's asking you, how often would Jeff have needed to measure Roger's speed? Uh, to find lower and upper estimates within 1.1 mile of the actual distance he ran. So what this kind of hinges on is if we look back at the graph, let's see if I can find a good graph over here. If we look back at like this graph here, um, let's, let's cut ourselves off from A to B here for a moment. Okay, we'll just zoom in here. The total error between the estimates can be viewed like this, right? Here's the overestimate. Here's the underestimate for this first interval here. So really it's like we've got this box right here would be the total amount of error if I were to map it over to like here. Okay, so we've got like a box of this width and height. This is the difference between the over and underestimates for that interval. Same thing here, the over and underestimates for this middle interval would be a box about this size. And same thing on this third interval. The lowest he went was zero. The highest he went was here. And so you can look at this as the you know difference between over and under. And if we're sticking with geometry, which we should, we can see this total, uh, this area here is really the distance between you know, f of b minus f of a. So the distance between these two endpoints here and here times delta t, the, the width of the rectangles. And so what this question is asking, sorry if that makes you dizzy, um, how often would we ne need the uh, data to keep those estimates within 0.1 miles of the actual distance? So that means the kind of the error, we want to keep that at 0.1. And you know we want to keep this less than or equal to f of b minus f of a, which is the last value. So the last speed, 0 minus the first speed, 12, times delta t. Then we would take this you know, 0.1 and divide it by this length just works out to be 12. So divide 0.1 by 12. And this would be what we need to keep our delta t less than. So 0.1 over 12 is less than 0 0.08333, et cetera. Sorry, that's 0 0.008. OK, but this would be how accurate we'd need to be with the time measurements in order to um, keep the data that close. OK, so again, if we wanted to change this, we would have to change this as well. All right, the amount of time and hours between our uh, data points. And this lines up with what we know already, which is, you know, the more accurate we want to be, and I'll zoom back here again, the more accurate we want to be, 
with our estimates, the more rectangles we're going to need. And when we say more rectangles, we really mean thinner rectangles, right? Smaller time windows so that we can eventually approximate the actual area. And so this is where limits come into play. We take the limit as this, as these rectangles go to zero. All right. Um, we'll do one more example before I give you some notation you'll need for the next section, and then we'll call it for that. So here, a ball is tossed vertically in such a way that its velocity function is given by V of T below. So here, again, this is V, this is T in seconds. And V of T is 32 minus 32 T. So it's asking, what is S of 1 minus S of 1 half? What is this really asking? It's asking, what's the change in position, right? The total distance traveled between 1 and 1 half. So what are you really looking for? You're looking for starting here and ending here. The total distance would be the area under the curve, right? And so what is the area under the curve? Well, it's the area of this triangle here. You could use rectangles to approximate it, but if you can find the area using geometry, you should just do that because it will be exact. So we know that the area under this curve is a you know length of one half so the area of the triangle is a length of one half times the height the height is going to be you know v of one half at this point here so v of one half is 32 minus 16 which is 16 and since this is a triangle you multiply it by half right half base times height and so this is 16 over 4, which is 4 feet. Okay. Um, and so what is this? This is 4 feet upward since this area was on the positive side of the graph. Okay. Um, so that's the total change in position. It went 4 feet upward during this time interval. And again, we just told that from the uh, velocity graph. Notice I can't tell you where it is in space. I can only tell you how far it went. So that could have started from the ground. It could have started from a million feet in the air. We don't know. What we do know is that it went four feet up during that time. All right. And the last part here, S of 2 minus S of 0, that's the total change from starting here to starting here. So that would be, again, the... Uh, signed area here since we're talking about displacement we're talking about its position so this would be the amount that it moved upward from zero to one and then from one to zero one to two this would be the amount that it moved downward you might you know kind of already know from this graph that it had positive velocity so it was like going up and then came down to something like this right so this first part, it went up. How much did it go up? Well, it went up 32 over 1 um, over 2. So this is, you know, 16 feet in this triangle. And then the same thing down here. This is negative 16 feet. You could have maybe just seen this with symmetry, too, without needing to go ahead and, and take the area. But we'll know that the, the net change in position here is 0 right? Um, so this is, you know, the, the ball got tossed up in the air and landed back in the same height, okay, landed back at the same position. Now, how far did the ball travel is a different question, right? If we're talking about the odometer, then you're really talking about the absolute value of these two things, right? The total distance traveled. But the displacement or, you know, the change in position, that's just the net change. And since it had upward and downward velocity, it's going to end up back up at the same place. So zero feet displaced. Okay. So that's the area distance problem. Um, in a nutshell, kind of what we're after, how we solve the problem crudely with rectangles. And the last thing you're going to need for this is uh, what we call summation notation because we need to make this process less cumbersome. And so I'll give you a quick refresher on how summation notation looks. If you have something like this, let's say this is pretty close to what we'll be dealing with. 
Um, but let's let's simplify it for a moment. All right, let's let's do it like this. Uh, we'll say two times i. So this is called the sum from i equals zero to n of two i. Okay, and the way you should read this, if you're a computer science student too, this is a for loop, right? This is your start. This is your end. And this is, and these are your terms, you could call it. Okay. And so each time you go up uh, a term, you tick up your index by one. So starting at i equals zero, you add each term and let i increase by one every time. So this would look like two times zero to start with plus two times i equals one, plus two times two, plus two times three, plus whatever n is, let's say for now, for the sake of the example, n is five, then this would be plus up to two times five. All right, and again, since we can do a little algebra here, we can factor out the two, and this is really two times one plus two plus three plus four plus five, and so 9, 12, uh, sorry, 9, 12, uh, 16, so 32, right? Going pretty fast here. 15, 30, thanks. So in general, it's this process. You start here. This is what you end your index um, with. These are your terms, and each time you just take i and then go to i plus 1, i plus 2, etc., up until the next point. So for our purposes, when we're looking at these rectangles, we're going to divide our interval up into n sections. We'll start at i equals 0, go up to n. We'll take the height of each x sub i, um, you know, a little piece of the interval, and then multiply it by our delta x. And this is what we call the Riemann sum, and we'll, we'll go into that later. But this is that process we talked about for under a curve. You split it up into n pieces. And here's x0, x1, all the way up to xn. And then, you know, here would be the height f of x0. So then we're grabbing you know, the height times your delta x are these widths, right? And repeating that process that you saw me do. This is just the formal way to write up something so that we don't have to write 15 terms in a row. We can just write this and, and represent it simply. Okay, so that's some notation. Uh, so I hope this is helpful, and uh, we'll see you in the class discussion.